Dear academic colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests from the European Space Agency, Tallinn University of Technology has a privileged opportunity to listen to Johann Dietrich Werner, the Director General of European Space Agency. For most of you, I think European Space Agency as a label and trademark is well known. For those of you who maybe are not that updated or don't know how Estonia relates to European Space Agency, I'd still like to say a few words. World was launched to space roughly 60 years ago when the first Sputnik was launched and orbited, orbited the globe. Since then, there have been hundreds of space missions, hundreds of astronauts or cosmonauts or whoever we call them, thousands of satellites and other space exploring efforts. Small Estonia became a space nation roughly three years ago, although the preparatory work started long before that. This was when the SQ-1 was launched. And since then, we've managed to join the European Space Agency, and now several space-related projects are carried out in Estonia as well. As for all of you, members of the academic community or business community in Estonia, European Space Agency is a reliable, useful, and good partner. The agreements on the national level has made up a full member of the European Space Agency, opening the doors to cooperative projects, uh, joint efforts also being part of the governing board, and so on and so forth. But what I think is the most important to potentially everybody of you is that there is a possibility for a traineeship with the European Space Agency. That is the way to get in touch with cutting edge academic as well as applied and technological research and development work carried out with the space in mind. I hope this presentation brings you a little bit closer to what European Space Agency is aiming at, what they are dreaming about, and what might be your role in our joint efforts to explore space for our, our bilateral benefit. Now a few words about today's speaker the Director General Johann Dietrich Werner. He's an academic himself, being also a president or a rector of a major German technical university in Darmstadt. He later became leader of the Ger uh, German Space Agency and then moved to head the European Space Agency in Paris. With a long and strong academic background and contacts to very many leading academic as well as technological institutions in the world, and especially in Europe, I think he's the right man to give young academics an insight to what Europe, space, and European Space Agency is about. So please, Johann Dietrich Werner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. It's fine weather. I'm really glad to be here. It's the best weather. Thank you very much for the preparation of that. So as you heard, I'm the Director General of the European Space Agency and I would like to tell you a little bit about what we are doing, what you can do as uh, well. So not only it's not only about us, it's also about you. But of course, at the beginning, just to tell you the story, in 1964, uh, two organizations were founded in Europe to have something also in Europe, not only in the United States of America and at that time in the Soviet Union. They were merged later on, and so in 1975, the European Space Agency was founded um, and have, has now about 22 member states, 
20 out of them at the same time at the EU. This number may change because of Brexit. Uh, then we have 19 out of the, out of the EU, but uh, UK will still remain a member of ESA and uh, that means we have uh, Norway and Switzerland already not being a member of the EU. So this is our environment. So we are international on a European scale uh, from the east to the west, from the north to the south. Uh, you heard already that was a story some uh, 50, 60 years ago, the race in space driven by the two power, st uh, power states. Uh, one was the uh, uh, American side and the other one the Soviet side and it was towards the moon. And it's a little bit forgotten that of course there was a big achievement of the United States of America to have to land the first man on the moon. But at the same time, approximately the same time, the Russians were, or the Soviet Union was very successful in having robots on the moon, uh, also bringing back stuff, uh, material from the moon back to Earth. This is a little bit forgotten, but it, it was a very successful story on both sides. Right now, we are in a totally different world. I call it Space 4.0, because we are working in space beyond national borders and also beyond uh, earthly problems. I don't know whether it's possible to shut down the light, that would be very nice uh, because uh, the space is dark uh, and I would like you to see space. So we are in a situation that uh, something is changing and you, the young people over here, you are the drivers of the future and we, the old guys, we have to be careful that we are not in the role of the dinosaurs, seeing a meteorite and believe, okay, we can have a wish. So there's a totally different world right now. We are in a shift of paradigm, change of actors, more than 70, member, uh, 70 states worldwide are space-faring states. We have a change of contents. Space is not any longer just a question of prestige. It's day-to-day -day infrastructure with navigation, telecommunication, earth observation, and there's also a change of roles. So ESA takes this up and say, okay, we are trying to combine society, politics, science and industry uh, to do something together. And there is what we call a seamless chain of innovation. And there, the role of academia is very important because mainly academia is working in this field, basic research, applied research. On this side, it's more the industrial part to make out of that products. And what is necessary to have a seamless chain from the left to the right, but again, this world is changing right now with more and more coming in on this part, industry um, and economic uh, investors, etc. So we are in a changing world and this is a big opportunity for each and everyone who would like to go into that. And at the same time, we are looking not only for technologies using in space and using space coming down with some results for different areas, but it's also time, another shift of paradigm, to use technologies proven on Earth in automotive or in entertainment or wherever to use them in space as well. But at the same time, we are discussing about Europe. And you know that Europe is a little bit endangered. And I am a very convinced European, um, but this should not be the only European spirit we have. So European spirit should be more than just a ship. It European spirit should be also more than just a nice weather spirit. It should also work when there is some problems uh, in Europe. So my education was clear. European Union, this is the future, and maybe we go even to the uh, United States of Europe. But as we know, we are a little bit far away from that. We so must what recreate the European family this is in Winston a regional Churchill. structure, called it maybe the United States of Europe. So th th that was uh, Winston Churchill saying that. Uh, but as this is a little bit far away, what I can do in my position as the Director General of ESA, I can work for United Space in Europe, meaning joining forces uh, to this, for the sake of citizens, for the sake of our development. And this is European spirit as well. This is a French TV, and usually the French are very much oriented toward France, as many European countries. But this is at the prime time, the news in France, and they discussed with this guy on board of the International Space Station. And this is not a French one. This is a European astronaut with a very British accent. It's a British citizen, Tim Peake. And I think this is something we have to 
develop in future to work together across the borders, of course still having a national identity, not leaving their own country, this is not the, t uh, the purpose, but uh, to work together. And ESA with its very special way of working uh, with the diversity of uh, 22 member states, we are at the same time also a good facilitator for global cooperation because we are the only space agency worldwide having different nations as members and therefore we have a very special opportunity. So what is all about? We are discussing about, of course, global challenges. You know this list and all of these uh, issues are important. One is usually forgotten and I put it over here, this is curiosity. Curiosity is even a stronger driver than all of these things. Curiosity was bringing us out of the caves. Curiosity is uh, developing new things. By the way, here are still some seats available. This is typical for a professor looking from the front. I see always the empty seats, you see always the occupied seats. But there are several uh, empty seats over here. Please don't hesitate to come in front and take them. So space is today more than just, as I said, a question of prestige. It's information, it's communication, science, technology, education, and inspiration, linking directly to curiosity. So what I'm talking about. This is a picture of planes in Europe. Each yellow dot is one plane. It's a very concrete problem. Air traffic control, very concrete solution. Another very concrete problem is over here, traffic. Very concrete, not typical for Tallinn as I learned, much better here. But uh, of course, again, it's a typical, very concrete problem. You might find uh, concrete solutions. But then there are different types of problems, and one is dark matter. If uh, the astronomers look into a universe and see a galaxy, then from the calculational point of view, the movement, the velocity of stars at the outer part of the galaxies should be slower, should be lower than in the center just because of the question of gravity. So it should be something like this, the, the, the velocity should go down the farther you go to the outer part. But in fact, if we look into the universe, it is different. It's more or less a constant speed. We don't know what the reason is. One explanation is dark matter, but this is not an explanation. Dark matter means we did not understand the problem. There are different theories what it is. It is not black material. That would be a different thing. It is dark matter, meaning we don't know what it is. Another thing is dark energy. We, are, uh, we believe that the universe was developing coming from a Big Bang and is expanding. But just because of gravity, this movement should slow down, maybe finally collapsing. But the universe is behaving differently. For several billions of years, yes, it slowed down, but it is um, again accelerating. There is no final explanation of that, and therefore we call it dark energy, because there should be something driving the universe um, in, uh, in, in higher speeds. And both together, dark energy and dark matter, is about 96% of our universe meaning we don't know really a lot. We know about something like 4% of the logic of the, of the universe. And this is what drives me to curiosity. And now they found out there might be even another planet in our solar system. Very surprising. So for years and years and years everything was clear. The only question was whether Pluto is still to be named a planet or not. And then some researchers said, okay, let's just make a final proof that we know all about our solar system, that there is not another planet. Let's look to the movements of the planets we know very detailed. And when they did so, they found out there is something strange. There must be another planet. Nobody had ever seen it, but there is some evidence. And uh, interesting enough, the researchers know about the size, but they don't know whether it exists. This is a little bit in contradiction, but this is typical for what we are uh, tackling. We are working with the unknown, and we try to find some res results for the unknown where we do not can really put the question on the table. And this is something I, I think, I hope, all of you are inspired by.
Now, what, is, what are we doing? We are doing, of course, Earth observation with, uh, U, uh, with the European Space Agency for different types, for more scientific use or for more weather satellites, for more day-to-day -day use. Uh, but what is important, and especially I'm happy to be here in Estonia, where you with the digitalization are really the front runners in uh, Europe, if not in the world. And there is something you can really bring to this uh, story. This is that we get the data from different sources, from space, from air, from in situ. We are putting them together by processing and from there we come to information. Only then, over here, we have what we call big data taking the different sources at the same time. And again, there is a shift of paradigm. This is more, more uh, in the future, more oriented towards institutional supports, while here we have more and more commercial activities uh, on the right-hand side. Just an example for this fusion of data, what I mean. You, you cannot have this picture of the highest mountain of the world by any instrument. Mount Kea is higher than the Mount Everest. But because of the water, you cannot have just one image of it. But by putting together data from underwater plus a satellite picture, you suddenly have a full picture, just as an example. Of course, what we need for that is storage, a lot of storage, because it's not only for today, we want also to storage the past and today for the future. So this is another aspect we have to consider. And uh, we in ESA are developing it, and we are developing also it together with industry. For instance, in the case of uh, telecommunication, we are doing this in public-private partnership with industry. You all heard about navigation, of course, GPS signal, and everybody is using it right now. We are developing a European system, and in the future you will use both without knowing it. You will use the Galileo signal as well as the GPS signal, and therefore the accuracy uh, and the reliability will be much better, and especially if in some crisis case the Americans decide that we should not have a good GPS signal, then we will have a stable Galileo system, which is necessary also for, for instance, for aircraft control and other uh, security-related uh, aspects. I would like to use this example as another plea for this seamless chain of innovation. Because uh, you know, of course, the theory of Albert Einstein. I'm quite sure that you could explain immediately the equation. So he wrote the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. And in both, he said something about timing. Um, he said, time is slowed down by velocity, and time is slowed down by um, gravity. So what does that mean for our daily life? Where is there any return of investment for decades this was just the theory of a scientist, nothing more. And I plead for it, we should always do things like that because you never know. In this case, this theory has a big influence on the navigation system because what we have on the satellites is nothing more than very accurate clocks. And these clocks send their time signal to the Earth. And in your final instrument, this instrument gets now from different satellites, the different time signals, and calculates by that where it is right now. So, exact timing is of major importance. Now, the, the problem is time is slowed down by velocity. The satellites are rather fast. Huh, we have a problem. Ah, we have a hope. Time is slowed down by gravity. Um, that means uh, as uh, we have less gravity over there, uh, time is accelerated. Maybe they compensate. No, they don't compensate these two effects. And without knowing it exactly, there would be a mistake of about 500 meters in one hour. So what we need is fundamental research. What we need is applied research, technology development, and then we come to products. And we know, don't know what will happen with gravitational waves. ESA has a special project in that called LISA. Um, it's not according because my daughter is, has the same name, it's the other way around. Uh, so this project is much older already than my daughter. But with LISA we would like to use gravitational waves as a new method to observe the universe. Right now we can do it with optical instruments, we can do it with radio waves. Um, and in the future we may use gravitational waves 
f also for that. And uh, the project is already rather old, but we are happy that now we are in space with a first demonstration experiment with a Pathfinder. And as we know from December last year, there was a discovery in the United States that this really exists, these gravitational waves, so we are on that line as well. Another issue is, if it's an important call for me, please take it. Maybe some millions for either. I'm always happy if I get phone calls like that. Okay, so the space to be around the Earth, it's a special, very special challenge. We have more than 600,000 particles of a diameter of at least one centimeter. I don't know who of you saw the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Uh, George Clooney was not important for me, but uh, Sandra Bullock. Uh, and this uh, movie is uh, rather realistic with the, in that respect, because the particles are so fast, 28,000 kilometers per hour, that they, of course, can destroy people, but also uh, instruments. We had an uh, incident like just two weeks ago. One of these particles hit one of our satellites and uh, put a hole into the solar panel, so we know exactly what is happening. Um, but in addition, we have uh, meteorites coming down. This is Chelyabinsk, um, where a particle a, a meteorite came down to the Earth. It was much smaller than that one uh, which hit the Earth when the dinosaurs died out. But this is uh, one of the results uh, where the meteorite hit uh, the uh, small lake. Um, this could be a bigger one in the future, and we have to safeguard our Earth. Very difficult. We had a flyby of a meteorite, uh, an asteroid, some uh, weeks ago, and it was just discovered hours before it, f uh, it flew by. So we have to do something, uh, and we should not think uh, like this uh, Danish uh, beer producer saying, okay, no problem, we will observe the thing from the moon. This is not sufficient, and we should not consider that Bruce Willis will do, will, will do it again. He did it once, and that was already heavy enough for him. So therefore, we have a project where we would like to observe what can we do together with NASA, the American Space Agency. Yes, there is another space agency, not only ESA, so there is uh, NASA. Uh, and there is a small asteroid with even a smaller asteroid moon. And so we will go to hit it and then observe it. And as the Americans are better in shooting, they will hit it and we will observe it. So this is the idea uh, as we are going forward. We are producing new, a new launcher system. We have very successful Vega and Ion 5 already. We are now producing Vega C, Ion 6, but again, this is not the end of the story. We will go further on. But there's another competition in the world. You all know, of course, the name Elon Musk, either because you are paying by PayPal in the internet, or you heard about Tesla, the electric cars. Elon Musk also developed a space company called SpaceX for space exploration. And he said, okay, I will build a, a, a cheaper rocket. Everybody was saying it's not possible. We know how complicated rockets are. He will not succeed. Okay, he built it, he succeeded. Then he said, why not reuse the rockets? After flying up, we can get them back and fly again. He does not call that used rockets, he called it flight-proven rockets, which is, again, already something very nice with wording. He is trying that. So far, he did not succeed, finally, but he is trying it. And you see here a movie of one of his trials. He tries to land on this small drone ship. Everything went very well. Uh, there was some small problem here with one of the legs, uh, and then it happened that, uh, unfortunately, this uh, rocket exploded finally, so it is not only flight proven, it also damage proven. So therefore, now the question, the thing I would like to convey to you, the message is not, okay, this is bad, but I would like to convey a totally different message. I looked into newspapers. I'm from Germany, as you could Im immediately recognize by my accent. So this is the German newspaper. SpaceX failed again with landing trial, launches absorbs crash landing. I mean, they were right. Huh? This is exactly what you saw. However, I show you now the American newspaper. The American newspaper said, Falcon 9 almost landing. A better wording. Now I show you what Elon Musk was saying in his tweet. He said, ship is fine, minor repairs, exciting day. <laughs> and I think this spirit 
we have to, leave, to have a little bit more in Europe, uh, not to be always risk averse. Of course, we have to take uh, measures not to have too big risks, but we have to go also further. And we have some European heritage. There is a long list, and you, of course, agree with all of this, diversity of culture, philosophy, arts, science, development. But pioneering and exploration, this is European, and we should go on with it. Uh, and we are going it. One mission which was really pioneering was to go to a comet with a mission Rosetta. We went to the comet Churyumov Gerasimenko. This is a European spacecraft with a smaller lander, which was produced by some of our member states, Germany, Italy, France, and some others together. And we brought them to the comet, and then from a distance of 20 kilometers, we said just File Go, the name of the lander, File Go. File had no possibility to control its movement by itself. You have a turning comet, and from 20 kilometers far away, you just say go and hit and land. So it, it went to the comet, it was trying to land, it had its three legs, and because the, the gravity is very low, we were afraid that it will go down and then jump up again and being lost. So we had some harpoons in the legs. The harpoons did not work. So it jumped up again for several hours, came down again, jumped up again, came down again, and finally it landed. We did not know what does it mean it landed. There is some picture. By the way, all of this is black, like charcoal. So you could say 50 shades of gray in a very special way. Uh, and this is a selfie. This is one of the legs. And uh, this is a sound which was measured at the first touchdown. So it's just, just a repetition. And from this sound, the scientists developed and calculated this, the surface, the stiffness of the surface of this uh, comet. We got a lot of results. We know now that water is not coming from this type of comets uh, because water was not on Earth all the time. Water wa uh, Earth was too hot for having uh, um, water over here. So this was one result, but we still did not know where is this tiny filly. It's, a, it's the size of a washing machine or something like that. So we were not, we did not find. We found it just on the 5th of September of this year, and it's over there. You see, this, it should land over here. It jumped up and jumped and jumped it over there. There, it's in a very shadow, nice shadow place. You see here a picture. We found it finally. Um, this situation is also the reason it did not work for a very long time. The batteries were full, so it could work for nearly uh, two and a half days. That was perfect. That was the original plan. But then we wanted to recharge the batteries, and this did not work 100%. It's clear now because this uh, place was uh, a shadow place. But we got all the results. We are very happy. Now, I hope you can feel this spark of curiosity that it makes sense to have a mission like that. It's inspiring. If you are now on the side of the economist saying, what is it good for me on Earth? I have an answer for you as well. But I hope that all of you are already satisfied that that is important. The answer for the others is, yes, this camera on board, because of these shades of gray, we brought it back, it's now looking above trees, and whenever there is something gray coming out of the trees, the camera can decide whether it's uh, fog, smoke, vapor, or whatever. So it's for early fire detection of forests. Coming back to these explorers, Columbus. I don't know whether you know this guy, for instance, I'm sure the young people do not know it. It's Jacques Picard. Jacques Picard was an explorer who explored the deep sea 10,000, 11,000 meter deep in the Mariana Trench. He was a pure explorer, as his whole family, his uh, son, his father, all of them were explorers. He's a Swiss guy. Now, I hope you know this one. Also an explorer, a typical US movie. You know the name of him? Somebody should know. What is the name of this? It's Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard, and in the movie he is born in La Barre, in France, and it's a British actor, Patrick Stewart. So the Americans, to have a real good exploration movie, they had to use 
the name of a Swiss explorer. They have to have a French p person and a British actor. So it's clear. It's a European. So therefore, we have to go on with that. And our European uh, explorers are this. These are all European astronauts of different nationality. Uh, UK, Denmark, Germany, Italy, France, and uh, Italy again. Uh, he will fly at the end of this year to the station. This picture shows something what we can do with space. Of course, there are earthly conflicts. Name it the Ukraine crisis with Crimea. At exactly at that time, this crew started from, was launched from Baikonur in Kazakhstan to the station. So, an American astronaut, a Russian cosmonaut, and a European astronaut with German nationality or German accent. And I think, therefore, this picture shows what space can do. We can work like science beyond earthly conflicts, and this is very important to bridge earthly, conf earthly conflicts. Science can do that, and space can do that as well. This is a, a short movie. I have to stop for it. I go back. So I shot this movie when I was there at the launch pad. You see my right hand uh, with, the, with the ring, so it's really my hand. Uh, and these are the three, and this is just hours before they are launched. So. So then they move, and if you have a chance to see a launch, I recommend you to go to Baikonur. If you go to the Americans or the Europeans, our security measures are so strict, so, so far away you can see it, you can hear it, but in Kazakhstan you can feel it. Uh, that's the difference. And they went to the International Space Station, America, Russia, Japanese, Europe, and Canada. And they are doing a lot of experiments on board of different size, times, I will not uh, Types. I will not go into this detail. Um, uh, all of this is uh, not uh, housekeeping, so, but what they are doing is really research on board. But sometimes the astronauts, as our ambassadors, they look to the Earth and they give us some images and some feeling what they see. For instance, the beauty of the Earth. This is uh, New Zealand. But they also see, of course, the dark side of what is happening. For instance, here, explosions and rockets flying over Gaza. Uh, so they are our ambassadors in space. Or another picture, this is Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, Italian nationality. She shot this picture. You see the moon, which I like. And then you see over here that there is some atmosphere on the Earth. We know we are breathing this atmosphere. But do we have any feeling how thin the atmosphere is? I will give you an example. The uh, diameter of the Earth is about 12,000 kilometers. And if you go up to the Mount Everest, some of the people can still breathe. Not me, but some others can do. So it's about eight kilometers where you can breathe. Now, if you look to the comparison to a football, how thick would be the, the, the layer where you could still breathe? And to give you a feeling, it's just the thickness of a hair. So it's really thin, so we better take care of it. This was then the landing. This is landing with the Russian Soyuz, and they call it a soft landing. Yeah, and this is because you have to uh, absorb this landing by the soft parts of your body. That's the meaning of soft landing, nothing more than that. What are the next destinations? Where to go? Uh, some believe we should go directly to Mars, and I'm quite sure if I would ask you, many of you would say so. The Americans call it the journey to Mars, but if you see, they know that they have to do a lot of things in between because uh, of some problems. We do not have the right propulsion system, so work for you. We do not know how to take uh, safety and security into consideration, work for you. Health. It takes about two years to go to Mars and back with today's technology. To go to the moon and back, you can do it in summer vacation, one week. Uh, if you have a problem after two days, okay, you wait for another three to four days and you are back, Apollo 13. But if you are on the way to Mars and you discover that you have cancer after three months, you have a problem for another two years. So therefore, health is something. Pi psychology, if you have ever seen Mars uh, in, in the in the sky, it's a very tiny red dot. If you are on Mars, you see just a tiny blue dot. That's yours. 
Radiation on the way to Mars, very heavy, very difficult in communication as well to say, Houston, we have a problem, would take you 20 minutes. Huh? Uh, to go to Google, 40 minutes until you get the response, so it's not really a pleasant one. The question is always, is there water on Mars? And this question we can answer today, yes, it is. There is water on Mars, and you can even test it at home. But the Europeans found it also on the planet Mars with a special camera. You see here frozen, uh, frozen uh, water on Mars. Uh, and we are right now on the way to Mars with two missions. One was launched some uh, month ago, uh, where we are looking for life on Mars, whether there was some life or whether there is still some life. Of course, not uh, intelligent life, but this is also the question for the Earth. Is there really intelligent life on Earth? It's not clear so far. But on uh, Mars, we are looking for something, some traces of life. With this mission, first we look to the atmosphere, we have a demonstration lander, and then we will have a second mission where we drill a hole uh, into the surface of Mars to look whether there is something what we call life. But for me it's important not only to think about Mars, but Moon is still an interesting aspect. And therefore I put a list of what we can do on Moon, um, uh, human and robotic, private and public, it can also be a stepping stone to go beyond, because I'm quite sure humans will go beyond our, uh, our Earth um, if they are really smart enough to maintain this Earth, they will leave it as well. Uh, so therefore, the moon uh, is an interesting point. Um, I call it therefore a single place, but multiple uses and multiple users, and a name for that is the moon village. Now, what we can do over there is clear. We have water on moon. We can produce on the far side of the moon a, a radio telescope to have a deep view into the universe, much better than from here because we have plenty of space. And first, uh, and the second thing is, we do not have the uh, interaction with radiation coming uh, coming from the Earth if we go to the far side. The Americans are already nervous a little bit. They pay attention what we are doing over here. Uh, this is uh, in the American CNN news. Um, and some Scandinavian uh, companies believe that because I said Moon Village, they should produce some single houses, maybe also a church and a city hall. This is not the idea I have. If I say Moon Village, I mean really a technical aspect to bring together different actors, different possibilities. Now, if you look to the world, you young people, maybe you are a little bit frustrated or afraid about economic crisis, about the question of migration, about the climate change, uh, maybe also about uh, terrorism. And it's very important that we prepare the future. There must be a future and uh, you should be the future. You should be inspired by what we are doing. And I think science and exploration has this power, uh, whether it's robotic or whether it's uh, with humans. This is a Danish uh, Andreas Morgensen, a European astronaut with a Danish nationality, and I think they showed that how important that is. At the same time, space is also fulfilling all these economic requirements. So, so you can say one euro invested in space gives you back six euros um, as a, in economic return. So therefore, I think it is very well done. Just a final word, again, coming back to the Albert Einstein uh, story, here's another story of Michael Faraday. He invented the, the uh, production of electric energy, electricity uh, by induction. Uh, and uh, he had, as we sometimes also have, a visit from politicians. And it said that the Prime Minister came to his lab, saw this experiment and said, very nice, but what is it good for? And the answer of Michael Faraday was very Michael Faraday was very smart. He answered, no idea, but you will tax it. And this is therefore uh, one of the answers. I want you for ESA, and now I'm here. If you have any questions, comments, or whatever, I would be more than ready to answer it at, or to take your comment and uh, do something out of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, other questions? 
Hello, my name is Gleb, and I have a question about uh, robotics. Uh, we know that technology develops really, really fast, and soon it will be a situation when robot will be more efficient than human in a close space. And what will be then if it is will be better economically and uh, scientifically for walking? I think the, f the answer is very clear. We need the, co uh, the combination of robotic and humans. Now you could say, okay, but if we have the smartest robots, R2D2 or whatever, uh, can we not do it without humans? But do you have any idea how to measure the blood pressure at a robot? So why to measure blood pressure? It's not necessary at the robot, but the thing is, if you go to medicine, if you put a human in microgravity condition, then suddenly the body is changing. And there are a lot of open questions in medicine, like, for instance, the blood pressure regulation, the salt regulation. Another very important thing is immune system. You know that we have AIDS, where the immune system is too weak, and we have organ transplantation, where the immune system is too strong. Now, if you put a human in space, suddenly the immune system more or less collapses. And whenever a scientist has a parameter he is changing and getting a traumatic result. It is very frequently, it's the, the entrance to understand something. And the, so medicine, for instance, you will never, you will never ever uh, uh, compensate by uh, uh, robotics. But it's also in our genes. I mean, do you send a robot into holiday? Uh, or go into the internet and say, okay, Venice, I have here some pictures in Venice, now I know how it is. You go there still. You make some holidays. So it is in our human genes, so my understanding, that we would, would, would like to see it by ourselves. We want to be really there. And humans are still much more efficient uh, to discover. So for instance, on Mars, the robots are really, okay, you will develop better ones, but so far the robots are really slow and uh, complicated. But you're right. Robots is important. Therefore, ESA is not a human spaceflight uh, agency, we are not a robotic spaceflight uh, agency, we are a European space agency, putting both together and having the synergies. Thank you. Other questions? One over there and next to you. Oh, it's good that the sector, the director is here as a servant, very good. Very special. Uh, my name is Evgeny. Uh, I have kind of simple question. Is there is a need for establishing private ownership in space, on space objects. You think that's an easy question? Yes. <laughs> okay, my plan is when? <laughs> this is very difficult. Uh, so there is uh, some international regulation about that, uh, and the US uh, asked for being the country di discussing and deciding upon that. There are some companies now looking for um, uh, mining in space, using uh, asteroids and other uh, to get some imp expensive material back to Earth. So there is a debate on that, there is no final understanding, but it's a very important question and it's not an easy one. Okay, I have a, my name is Karel and I have a question, may I ask, how, you, how did you get involved with uh, space technology? I'm a civil engineer by profession. I got involved through my father in 1957. That was Sputnik. I was three years old and my father took me on his arm and said, Jan, look there, you see Sputnik. I did not see anything, but fathers are sometimes very convincing. So I said, yes, I see it. <laughs> you could not see it, uh, by the way. But uh, So this was the beginning of a permanent story, so I was following all the uh, thing in space. I never thought about that I could be a part of it. I was just, I did not dare to think about it. I did not apply for being an astronaut. I would like to be one, but I did not. So then uh, I became a civil engineer in a civil engineering office. I had very nice things to do. Then I um, tried to become a professor. I succeeded in that, a professor for civil engineering. And then I was the dean of the faculty, and then I was by chance elected as a president of that university. 
And in that function, I had already some contacts to space, professional contacts, and I became a member of the board of the German Aerospace Center, German Space Agency. And then, again by chance, suddenly I was the chairman of that uh, uh, German Aerospace Center, and at the same time, the head of the German delegation to the European Space Agency. And when they were looking for a new director general, I don't know how they could do this mistake, they elected me. So, this is, a, in a short words, something what I, would, what I would call, I'm a lucky man. Nothing more than that. Thank you. So those of you who have seen Sputnik in space have a bright future ahead. Any other questions? Uh, my name is Shu and I'm from Japan and I have a... Do you speak So no one who is there? I studied in the UK for two years, ah. so I think it's fine. So my me. Japanese is better than yours, you mean? No. Oh, really? Right, right. Okay, I practice. So, uh, as uh, I think, I think military military interest it has been a like driving force for space technology for the past years. And is there any concrete policy in ESA? Like yes. ESA about the uh, yes. like meter use yes. of your and technology. And just to, to tell the others, you, you understood my Japanese, right? Uh -huh. Okay, because sometimes people think I'm I'm joking. Uh, it was not joking. I was really speaking in Japanese. Just to, that that you don't think I made a joke on him. So, the convention of ESA is very clear: peaceful purposes, peaceful purpose. That in our convention which does not mean that we are not working on security. Security is not a military action. Security is a civil action. So security, we are doing something with Earth observation, especially with uh, cyber security, etc. But we are, uh, our purpose is peaceful according to our convention. More questions? Well, quite a lot. Thank you. Hey, my name is Robert and um what have been the biggest changes you have made at ESA? Mistakes? No, changes. That changes. <laughs> Mistakes would be a long story, but uh, um, I'm trying to, this picture of the dinosaurs I showed you at the beginning, this is, I'm now one year in that position, so I'm trying to convince my colleagues inside the organization as well as with the member states um, that we need changes. Uh, so they are not completely there. So far I changed the, what we call the ESA directors. I changed them in order not to have silos, earth observation, telecommunication, navigation, transportation, uh, exploration, science, but I changed them to overall to what I call areas. So some five areas to, to strengthen the interaction. This is something I would like to change. And the other one is a more public interaction. So last week we had also here in Estonia the citizen debate, we had that uh, Europe-wide, so to uh, get the information from the citizens to what they expect we should do. So uh, participation is another issue, but of course I'm also dealing with the real uh, stuff, but these are the changes from an organizational point of view. So Matis showed me that I have to come to an end, I don't know why, but he showed me I'm out of time already. Two minutes, okay. Two minutes, two I questions. I will be short with the answers. One was here and one. One there, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Johan, and as an architect, I'm really interested in uh, habitation in uh, space and other planets. So I wanted to ask, uh, how would you envision the first permanent settlements, let's say in space, on a moon or wherever? Thank you. I invite you for my lecture tomorrow night, uh, construction in, in space. Uh, this is where I will give a lecture tomorrow night. Uh, this is an interesting point. There are also architects, uh, space architects, uh, and there will be a habitation. I mean, with, with the International Space Station, we have already something, but it will grow, and I hope that we will have also one of the, uh, on the moon. Uh, but this is an uh, interesting field, and there are some specialists, so if you're really interested in that, send me an email. That means for all of you, if you are interested in something more, send me an email. My email address is very simple, jan.werner at isa.int. Now, I know I will not repeat it in order to have a limited number of re reactions, but don't hesitate. If you want to send something, then we will take care. Also, what uh, the rector earlier mentioned concerning 
uh, part-time uh, traineeship or whatever at uh, ESA, we can take care of that. So please. Uh, but we would like you to build the space in Estonia, just to make it clear. What do you think about traveling to Mars in common future? Is it possible that uh, people can travel to this planet? Yes. Okay, it's only t the question. I would not send people to Mars on a one-way trip. There is an organization in the Netherlands providing that idea. I think this is not okay to, to make a big brother by sending them there and uh, let them die. We should, have, we should bring them back. I'm very sure humans will go to Mars. I'm very sure that humans, if they survive here, will go even further. They will do this. This isn't our genes. But it will take some time. So there are some Elon Musk believes he can do that in about 10 to 15 years. Some others say in 20 years, 30 years. Accelerate it. Come. Well, before we, we, we finish, uh, I'd like to say a few more words. Uh, the message I got and the reason why, I, why I'm standing here and why I'm enthusiastic and, and happy is because this is very, very, very interesting and challenging. This is something that is, is open for all kinds of, of efforts. And as I understand, European Space Agency is not an agency of astronauts or cosmonauts. It's an agency of people, including you. Everybody of you has a chance to contribute, one way or the other. So those of you who think this is an interesting thing to do, please try out. Please try out it with the efforts at Tallinn Technical University, with its uh, NanoQ program, be it then other space programs in Estonia, the traineeships, there are very many possibilities. So since space is limitless, I think that your dreams must also be limitless. So let us once more thank Mr. Werner for his presentation and look forward for a cooperative future.